Greetings, everybody, and thank you for joining us one more Sunday at St. Paul's United Methodist Church, where we get to be the heart, the hands, and feet of Christ so that all may come to know the love of God. We are so excited that you have tuned in to us this Sunday, and we have a magnificent service, as always, planned for you. A few announcements. Um, first, we want to make sure that you have on your calendars that on June, no, July the 24th, right after Sunday school, we will have an entire church-wide outing at McClay Gardens. There is a pavilion that has already been reserved. I hear there is great swimming and even a place to launch your kayaks. You just need to remember to bring your own lunch. And we look forward to seeing everyone out at McClay Gardens after Sunday school on July the 24th. Um, also, the Bible studies on Wednesday during the day and Wednesday evenings via Zoom, we are having them. If you have not been, please, we invite you to join us. We are having a great time going through our book study. And one more announcement for those of you who know Simon, we celebrate all the birthdays that have happened in July. So if July is your birth month, happy birthday to you. And today happens to be Simon's birthday as well. And we are thrilled. So thank you once again for joining us and we look forward to a great service. Please join me for our call of worship as we read responsively. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, you have created us and redeemed us. We will not fear. You have called us by name, and we are yours. We worship you.
let us join together in affirming our faith through the affirmation from Romans 8, number 887 in our United Methodist hymnal. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, we come before you in prayer, lifting to you our joys and our concerns, the hopes and the dreams, God, of our lives. May we also open to your voice and be open to the ways that you will speak to us that we may see with new eyes, that we may hear with new ears, that we may follow your direction as you lead us. Bless, we pray, this gathering of your people through the airways online, that we may grow and flourish in your love and your grace for the purpose to which you have called us. Hear our prayer, O oh God, for those whose lives have touched us, those who are in pain, those who are ill, God, for those who grieve. May we touch their lives, not only through our prayers, but through the way we live and through our actions. God, help us to be more like you in everything that we do. Guide us, bless us, uplift us, and hold us. We are your children, and we have been called for your purpose to be fulfilled in the world. And so now may we all pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Alright, greetings children of all ages. Today, in part of our scripture lesson, we see in Isaiah, or we read in Isaiah 43, 5, where the scripture says, Fear not, for I am with you. I have a question. Have you ever been afraid of something? I mean, really scared. Because sometimes if we're afraid versus if we're happy and content, things look different. We can be looking at the same things we've always seen and fear makes it appear differently. For example, have you ever gone to sleep at night and your eyes are just getting ready to close and you see a shadow on the wall and all of a sudden that shadow that you have seen time and time again looks so scary but it's the same shadow it's because of fear fear makes things look different somebody told me once that fear, spelled F-E-A-R, is false evidence appearing real. In other words, it's something that's always been, but it's distorted because we're looking at it very differently. Let me give you an example. I have this picture. Can you see it? Are you looking carefully? Do you see a duck? Or do you see a rabbit? Do you see a duck? Do you see a rabbit? Now the interesting thing is, one way we look at it, we can see a duck. The other way we look at it, we can see a rabbit. And I kind of think that that's how fear works. It makes us look at the same thing, but we begin to see it differently. It's like an illusion. When I was little, I was just talking about um, going to sleep. When I was little, I think I was about five or six, I had this poster on the wall in my room and I liked my poster. It was a poster, I still remember it, I just don't remember exactly what it looks like, but I remember there was a green character that was bright green and looked like lots of fun. Well, one day, and it lasted for a couple of days, I was going to sleep and I started having this strange dream that I was looking at the poster and this green cartoon character jumped off the poster and was like a monster and it was trying to come and get me. It was not real. <laughs> I was dreaming. But then when I woke up in the middle of the night and it was dark and I looked over at that poster, I was so scared. I was scared to move. I didn't want to get up because I thought it was a monster. It was the poster of the cute little green cartoon character that I saw all the time. That was fear stepping in. And that's why I believe God reminds us to fear not, for I am with you. So if you get into a situation and you are afraid of something that isn't even real, remember that you don't have to be afraid because God is with you. And even if you're still scared, because sometimes we are, it's a natural thing, it happens, that even when we are afraid, God is with us because God loves us and God is there to protect us. So let's pray. God, we are thankful that you are with us. Thank you for teaching us that sometimes things look different if we're fearful versus if we are happy or look different if we are joyful or if we're sad. Help us to know what is real. 
And what is real is that you, God, are with us and you love us and you are always surrounding us, caring for us to protect us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture today is Isaiah 43, verses one through seven. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. And I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Lord, for the word that you have for us this morning. May we be transformed in our hearts and may we grow to be more like you. Give us something to take with us this week, this year. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'll start with a question. Have you ever been wrong? I mean really wrong, wrong in a way that you knew you were wrong and that the things that people said you did, you actually did. In fact, you were guilty as charged and perhaps hoping that no one would ever find out about that particular wrongdoing. Have you ever been prideful? So prideful that maybe you deliberately chose to run across boundaries and break all the rules because perhaps you felt like in this moment these rules do not apply to me. You are not the boss of me. <laughs> I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to say what I want to say because that is what it means to really live. Have you ever hurt someone that you really loved and someone that loved you. Perhaps you yourself were in a moment where you felt pain maybe from that person or from others and the only way you had some semblance of control was to hurt them back. Or maybe you hurt someone not because you deliberately wanted to bring them pain, but because during that season, you weren't really even thinking about them. You were thinking about yourself. You see, whether we were wrong or went through a season of being prideful or hurt the ones we love, one of the toughest things to deal with <laughs> are the consequences. And I have found that sometimes we fear the consequences. 
Because maybe we just were in a different state, we weren't thinking, and then we come to ourselves, we realize what has happened, and we fear loss. We fear loss of loved ones. We fear loss of um, who we are in the world. Maybe we fear that our reputation will be ruined and no one will see us the same way anymore. The interesting thing about that is when we look at our own flaws, we see ourselves often through the lens of grace and that we were just kind of going through something and we grant ourselves forgiveness. And yet somehow when we see the flaws of other people, we begin to totalize their being and make it a character issue. They are a bad person. And maybe we fear because of the guilt and the shame that something like that will happen to us. So last week when we were here, we were in Isaiah chapter 6 where Isaiah had this big moment with the Lord. Perhaps you remember some of you, he says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up his train filled the temple. Isaiah talked about the seraphs that cried out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And then he let us into his moment where he felt his own guilt and shame. Oh, woe is me, for I'm a person of unclean lips. Maybe you remember that. And yet, he was forgiven. His sins and his guilt, they were blotted out. And the Lord called him to a great work. We asked ourselves, have we ever had a magnanimous experience with the Lord? So this week, we get to put ourselves not in Isaiah's shoes, thinking about the awesome and wonderful experience we've had with God. No, we're going to put ourselves in the shoes of the people, the Israelites who have been disobedient, who have dishonored God, who when God laid out God's precepts, they often and consistently went a different way. So here we are in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah 43. And the first word is, but. You see, um, from Isaiah 40 to Isaiah 55, it's what we called to call second Isaiah because the first chapters in Isaiah can be really, really rough. In fact, when we were in a Bible study, during the book study, a couple of the members said, I don't even want to deal with some of this. It is depressing because we see how the Lord was disappointed, even angry at the sins of the people. And then we get to second Isaiah, Isaiah chapters 40 through 55, which give us more comfort and hope. And Isaiah 43 begins with the word, but. But now thus says Yahweh, who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel, do not be afraid. And that is part of our word for today. Do not be afraid for I have redeemed you. The scripture says, I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be there. And through the rivers, they will not overtake you. What comes to mind for me, the children of Israel, when they are going through the Red Sea, and they don't know how they're going to make it. One of the things that my husband has often said to me, he says, it is our job to walk. It is God's job to part the sea. And sometimes, even when the sea is parted and God is making a way for us, we get fearful. 
We wonder if that thing that I did last week or last year, that thing that keeps coming back to me, the ways that I have disappointed my family, myself, and God, are these waters going to come crashing in on me? And today, the word of God says, do not fear, for I am with you. It says, if you walk through the fires, they will not scorch you. Come on, Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace, you will not be burned. Then it goes on for, I am the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel. The Lord God offers us comfort and offers us hope because God says that we belong to God. Friends, fear is a very real human condition. And when we get fearful, sometimes we begin to distort reality. Sometimes when we are too filled with fear and shame and guilt, we reject the truth that God loves us. And so that's why I am grateful for these chapters in Isaiah that remind us, that start with but. Why with but? Because yes, you did all of these things. Yes, we are guilty as charged. No, we do not always live up to whom God has called us to be, but. I am with you, says the Lord. I formed you, says God. You are mine. This week I've been reflecting on that. And as I began to continue in that chapter, the 43rd chapter, we didn't read it in the scripture earlier, but I need to read something to you because if we continue on going into the 19th verse here we find promise and restoration we've already had protection so i can't pass up this bit of good news verse 19 i am about to do a new thing says the Lord. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the deserts. The wild animals will honor me. I'm going to stop right there. I was planning to keep reading, but I'm going to stop right there. Listen, y'all, I was at Lake Ella earlier this week, and I sat in the outside chapel, and I was praying and meditating and thinking about this week's sermon. And I kid you not, this happened. I started singing. I left the outside chapel. I went to sit on the bench. I watched all the geese as they were just laid out and moving around. And I began to sing unto the Lord softly because I didn't want anybody to hear me when they were walking by. And suddenly a duck flew over and sat near me and just stayed for a while. And on the one hand, it might have been a coincidence, but I have declared that that creature of the Lord, that beautiful duck, came to join me in offering adoration and worship to God. So in this scripture, it is reminded, we are reminded that the animals will honor me. And then in verse 21, the people whom I formed for myself so that they might declare my praise. Restoration. What God is, I believe, trying to get us to know today is whatever you've done, whatever the fear of the future, whatever the guilt, I am with you says the Lord, and not only am I with you, but I'm going to do a new thing. It says, do you not perceive it? All right, St. Paul's, do you not perceive it? And before we get nervous 
and wonder is Pastor Latricia about to come and change a lot of things and God is gonna make something new. Let's talk about restoration. I was in a conversation with Gay the other day, you know, our magnificent organist whom we heard earlier and she's so much more than that. And we were talking about restoring musical instruments in particular we were talking about the organ. And what we share together in that conversation is there is beauty in restoration that still allows a thing to be made new. That when we take an organ that seems like it may be falling apart, but it has a rich history and legacy and looking at it reminds us of the people that have played and those whom we honored that to make it new doesn't necessarily mean we need to bring another piece of equipment in. Sometimes we want to restore what is already present because it is valuable in a way that cannot be replaced. I've only been at St. Paul's now for a couple of weeks. And as I've encountered new people, and as, I, and as I've asked the question, what do you love about St. Paul's? Invariably, what I am told are stories about Sunday school, and about gatherings, and about Wednesday night dinners, and about so many, and about the ways that the church cares for each other. And so when I think of God doing a new thing, I think of a process that continues from one person to the other. I'm told stories about magnificent clergy and lay persons who have come through this Place. God is about to do a new thing. Can you not perceive it? So when I think of an organ that has been restored, a new thing is being formed, not just because of the organ, but maybe because of the people who will now play its keys. Perhaps the person who played it 60 or 70 or 30 years ago isn't the same person that played it today. So it's the same organ that gives new melodies and has new life. Perhaps the space that this musical instrument once took up Maybe it's in the same corner, but the space has changed because the people are different. And so we enter into a situation kind of like a tree. I think about a tree that has the same roots, and yet the leaves on the tree become new every year. God is in the restoration business. The Lord is doing a new thing. Can you not? perceive it. We get to live into our mission at St. Paul's to be the heart, the hands, and the feet of Jesus so that all people, all of creation even, come to know the love of Christ. We have a discipleship strategy. I gave it for homework to those who were in the sanctuary last week. So if you're online, you get the benefit of not asking me if you did your homework. I'll just tell you that we get to live into our discipleship strategy, which is worship plus four. I won't tell you the answer. I'll let you look it up. It's online, but we get to live into that strategy with joy. I am excited because when I read the core values, the first one says that we are a place of joy where we value laughter. Today's word of restoration, I hope you find it to be a word of comfort and a word of hope for the future. A word that reminds you to fear not. 
Fear not, for God is with us. God has called us by name and called us to a purpose. And we get to live into it together. This is the word of God for all of God's people. Thanks be to God. Please join me in our closing prayer. God, our creator and redeemer, as we go into the world, we, knew th we know through your word that we have nothing to fear. You have created us, shaped us, and chosen us as your own. When we pass through the storm, you are with us. When we walk through the fires of life, we will not be consumed. Through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, we know we are loved, and by your Spirit, help us to go forth with joy, spreading your love in all that we do. Amen. Amen.